Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Nina Ha, and I'm the director of the Asian Cultural Engagement Center. I want to welcome you to, sorry about that, um, <laughs> the Career Power Hour panel. And before we actually begin, I would like to um, cite, recite the land acknowledgement. Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tutelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. Furthermore, the labor of enslaved people also generated revenue and enabled the creation of Virginia Tech. Because of this historical reality and legacy, as an institution, we have moral and ethical obligations to create a more diverse and inclusive community, one that includes those who were prohibited from attending Virginia Tech because of the legacy of racism in America and Virginia. This is a collective work and responsibility of inclusive VT, our institutional and individual co commitment to ut prosum in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence. So once again, thank you for um, attending the last week of EPIDEM, Asian Pacific Islander Daisy American Heritage Month. And I would now like to turn it over to the co-facilitators, Ms. Jacqueline Marmel and Ms. Melanie Doe. Thank you, Dr. Ha. I just want to say thank you to everyone and welcome. Good evening. It's so good. I can't see y'all, but I can see your names, and I'm glad that you're all here in community with us tonight. So as Dr. Ha said, um, my name is Jackie. I'm the chair of the Asian Pacific Islander Desi Alumni Society, also known as APITAS. Hi, everyone. I'm Melanie. Thank you so much for being here today. And I am currently the vice chair of the PETAs, working hand in hand with Jackie over here. <laughs> so um, just to quickly explain what a PETAs is, it is the newest cultural alumni organization at Virginia Tech. It's designed to serve the APETA community by connecting alumni and giving back to our alma mater. We've put this career panel together to uh, showcase talented and driven alumni who want to give students tips and tricks to navigate the professional world. But before we introduce them, uh, we would like to thank Dr. Nina Ha and the Asian Cultural Engagement Center, Career and Professional Development, SACE, and Ascend for co-sponsoring this event. We would also like to thank Ms. Latanya Walker, Ms. Renee Stewart, and Alumni Relations for helping us get our feet off of the ground. Perfect. Now we'll introduce our guest panelists. First, we have Huang Nguyen, uh, Chief Engineer at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency in class of 1989. Uh, next, we have Dennis Wang, Director of Product Management Bank Solutions at Pfizer. Did I, did I say that right? Perfect. And class of 1998. And then we also have uh, Jennifer Lowe. Did I say that correct as well? Perfect. Coordinator for New Student Connections at the University of South Florida in class of 2017. Last but certainly not least, uh, we have our moderators. Uh, we have Jackie Mar and staff aide uh, to Fairfax County School Board member uh, Carl Fish Frisch, Frisch in class of 2020. And Melanie Joe, Marketing Specialist at ICS, also class of 2020. So to our panelists, thank you all so much for taking the time to be with us tonight. We just want to start off like so the, uh, what's it called, the attendees can get to know y'all a little bit better. Could you each share with us a little bit of your background and how you ended up at Virginia Tech? And we can start off with Mr. Nguyen. Right. Um, first, I want to do a clarification on the introduction. I'm a chief engineer for data management. So I'm not the chief engineer for the whole agency. All right. There are several chief engineers. I just handle all the data for the agency. That's my, that's under my purview. <clears throat> and you're gonna be very unhappy with the answer on how to, I ended up at Virginia Tech. Remember, I'm an immigrant. My parents are immigrants and we came to the United States. So they didn't know anything. They didn't know English. I, my English wasn't great. I did not know that the school Virginia Tech existed. We had a, I was a senior in high school. Uh, a friend went there. And when he came home, he says, hey, you know, Asians, we always study engineering because that's all we know. You're guaranteed middle income class. All right. So he did the paperwork. I didn't even 
fill out the paperwork. That's, and you all laugh, but this is how Asian uh, immigrants survive in the United States. We stick with each other, uh, just like four years of Virginia Tech, right? So I know that's not the kind of answer a typical student would want to hear, but when you came over a long time ago and you didn't speak English, you didn't know about UVA, Virginia Tech, you knew George Mason because I live right here in Northern Virginia, but how did I end up at Virginia Tech? It was because of a family friend. He says, oh, you, you, you're going to study engineering. That's all we know. And of course, Virginia Tech is better than George Mason. But we all said, okay. And that's how I ended up there. Thank you. Mr. Wang? Oh, uh, very, very similar. <laughs> um, a family friend, I think, became the, one of the, the dean of English down there. And my father, who had done his dissertation with him, said, let's go down and check it out. So we went down, we went, and it was like, like wow, this is the middle of nowhere. Nice. Okay. And so anyway, we, we uh, applied, got in, and um, I, I became an engineer. But I, I had an interesting flavor because I became also a cadet uh, in the Corps. And, and uh, I... People have always asked me why, okay, and and I, I told them, you know what, they look really good in uniforms. <laughs> Tell me, they we don't look good. No, no, you're not wrong. I'm gonna, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> yeah, we look good. So, um, anyway, and and that's that's how we came to be. Uh, from an Asian perspective, I, I was from out of state, so I was from uh, Columbus, Ohio. And um, it was a, a really nice change to go from, say, a Midwestern city to um, Virginia Tech, Blacksburg. And at the time, it was, I think, the most high-tech uh, town, because technically it's still, I didn't know if it's a town now, but it used to be a town. So, so that's how we came to be. Thank you. Ms. Lowe? Yeah, so for me, both of my parents are immigrants. Um, my mom is Vietnamese and my dad is Chinese, um, but they both went to college in the United States. Um, and so college was the natural next step for me as I was getting ready to graduate high school, also coming from Northern Virginia. That was kind of the thing that everybody was doing, but I didn't really know anything about any of the colleges in Virginia. So I kind of threw out a bunch of applications um, and I knew a little bit about Virginia Tech just because I had two cousins who had also um, graduated from Virginia Tech. So I was like, sure, why not? We'll see how that goes. Um, and then I was accepted and I said, great, let me go there. And I hadn't even stepped foot on campus um, until I went there for orientation, but then I fell in love with it immediately and have obviously loved my experience since graduating from there too. So that's a little bit about my story. Thank you. And Melanie, what about you? Okay, it's so funny that Jennifer, you said that your first time stepping on campus was orientation because actually same thing. So um, the reason I wanted to go to Virginia Tech, okay, so I didn't have like, I, I mean, I did have friends that went to Virginia Tech and everything, but they influenced me not because yeah, they it was the only engineering school or anything. It's funny because I didn't even go for engineering. I uh, actually went for uh, English and communications. And so I went on a very different route. Um, but I always knew that I wanted to work like in the engineering field. Like I was always interested in engineering. I just didn't have the mind for it. So I thought, you know, the middle ground would kind of be communications because like I'd love to do the work for the engineers that they don't like writing and they don't like communicating, right? And, or not not necessarily all of them, but that's why I wanted to do and be the middleman. And so in high school, I, um, I also noticed like Virginia Tech wise or college wise, I wanted, I knew I was going to stay in state because I'm also from Northern Virginia as well. And a lot of friends from UVA, JMU, like other school, they never back as alumni and talked about how great their experience at Virginia Tech or at, at their schools were but every single hokey that I met they they were always like oh I'm going back to visit like wait for you know this uh, football game coming up and things like that and I was like what is so great about Virginia Tech and I'm very into spirit and so I knew like that that's the school from like I knew even before I um before I got accepted I I binded myself when I did early decision like I I was like, all right, I'm going to go here just because of the culture. And then when I stepped foot on campus, like I fell in love as well. So that's my story of how I got to Virginia Tech. 
I'm just gonna jump in real quick before um, we move on to the next question. I similarly, uh, I didn't step onto Tech's campus until orientation myself. Um, and so part of me, so prior to getting up to orientation, I was thinking to myself, I committed to a school and I have no idea what it looks like. Uh, I applied because I had tweeted about it. I was like, should I apply to Virginia Tech? And I had a, um, a follower who was a friend of my cousins and they were like, do it, it's the best decision I ever made. I went with that tweet, <laughs> I ran with it and here we are now. So I can definitely relate with all y'all. Um, you know, you kind of like taking a leap of faith because similar um, to what y'all have expressed, my parents didn't know too much about the different colleges, but that was the next step. So it was up to us to figure out what that step was um, and we ended up in the right place. So, but yeah, thank you all for sharing that. Well, I'm glad we all, I, it seems like we all liked Virginia Tech <laughs> even after graduating, so it's awesome. Um, okay, so I have the next question. Um, what was your experience like as an Asian American student at Virginia Tech? Did you guys ever feel like your identity impacted your experiences? And if so, how? Um, we can start with uh, Mr. Wang. Uh, I think my Asian heritage greatly supported me. It really greatly helped me because um, I hung out with other Vietnamese people because I'm would i being Vietnamese and the folks that went ahead of me helped me out like, oh man, that's a really hard professor. Oh, you take that class, you may only take 12 to 15 credits. Don't go crazy and take 18. Um, and oh, by the way, you're not going to finish in four unless you're willing to, to take 18 to 21 credits for one semester. So those are things that people can help you out. Uh, okay, electrical engineering, I, I, because most engineers study electrical engineering those days. Okay, but that's a really big field, which part? You know, and folks that graduated came back to help us out. So I think being Asian really, really, really helped us. Uh, there was a huge Chinese population from Malaysia. And then because they went ahead of us, all those students came ahead and said, okay, if you're going to graduate and go into this field, this is what you can expect. Here's the income level you can expect, uh, and what you know. And here, all my friends have been doing that have been have graduated in 15 years. This is what their life looks like right now. So, from a career perspective, being Asian really, really helped out. Yeah. Okay. Wow, we love that. Makes sense, absolutely. Uh, Mr. Wang, you can go. Um. I had a, I guess a different route because again, we had about 950 some odd cadets. Okay. And so out of those 950 some odd cadets, we only had two buildings, which was um, uh, uh, Rash and, oh shoot. Oh, I'm, I'm bad now, Brody. Okay. And those, <laughs> those were the two buildings and we were in essence a barracks more than anything. But I think out of that, um, I had, maybe I saw maybe four or five other Asians. So I guess I, I wasn't as exposed to the Asian culture because we're stuck in the barracks. <laughs> okay, that's what cadets do. Um, but I can say that um, from, from what I could see and what I could sense and what I could build, you know, those relationships, um, I, I would say that uh, from an Asian perspective, um, we, we were not that great, meaning number of people wise, but we were extremely tight. Okay. So um, I, I, that's the one thing I would say because out of in Blacksburg, there was 22, 23,000 students, another 10,000, you know, uh, residents. So maybe a total, maybe two, 3,000 Asians. So, you know, small population, very reminiscent of uh, the U.S. population. So. But I was ne I'd never felt isolated. Um, I had the culture as well as the, the core in that case from my perspective. So that was very, very nice. I love that. That's awesome that the core accepted you as well and mm -hmm. the other Asians as well. That's awesome. Perfect. Um, and Miss Lowe? Yeah, so I actually had a bit of a different experience um, as well. So for me, uh, the tone was set for me pretty early on. Um, I actually 
went to my first biology lab during that first week. And uh, we were doing that kind of situation where you introduce yourself to the people in your group and all of that. Um, and someone asked me, they were like, is Jennifer your real first name or is that your American name? And so I think for me, that really set the tone of like, oh, people already see me as kind of different. And so I think for me, I took that and I was like, I need to do whatever I can to fit in here at Virginia Tech. So I think for my first couple of years, I didn't actively seek out opportunities where I could meet other Asian folks or be in community with other people because I was like, obviously other people are going to see me as different if I do that. So I, I have to stay as far away as possible. And so I immersed myself in all sorts of other things and created community in other spaces around campus. But um, I became a member of a Panhellenic sorority and my big in my sorority is actually also Vietnamese. And so we were able to bond through that, even though we were one of very few people who were Asian in any kind of Panhellenic sorority at the time. And um, we would do things like go to the different Asian restaurants and try different things and all of that together. Uh, but then as I continued on in my experience, I found myself in a lot of different leadership positions around campus. Um, for things like working with orientation programs or being a tour guide and different things like that. And I found myself um, wanting to get even more leadership opportunities because I was like, if I'm not going to do it, then there are no, there's going to be no Asian representation um, in these other groups. And so I, I think at some point I started to feel like I had uh, kind of a sense of responsibility at that point because I was like, okay, I'm here and I want people to know that Asian people do exist at Virginia Tech and um, kind of creating community in those ways and um, educating other people and having really good conversations. So my experience is definitely a little bit different. No, I, I love that. I love how you decided to kind of be your own leader in that sense, like kind of being a representative of like, I, I mean, definitely can't represent the whole community, but at least having a face, you know, to like a in, in a world where it's like, maybe it's all like one race, like being different and like, that's okay. And like actually accepting that too. Like, that's awesome that you were uh, confident enough to do that, I would say. Awesome. So the next question is, um, when figuring out, you know, what you wanna do, some people know very early on when you're like five or six, I wanna be an astronaut, I wanna be a doctor, I wanna be so on and so forth. Other people, like me, uh, had to use all of undergrad to figure it out. And I know sometimes even after you leave tech, you're still trying to figure out what you want to do and where you want to go. Um, so the question is, you know, how did you decide which career path to take? And what was your experience navigating the job search and professional world? Um, and we can start off um, with Dennis. Or not. Or not, I can. <laughs> I, um, that's fine. Um, I, I am an engineer, so I'm an industrial engineer. Um, and I guess back, I guess they're still called uh, operations research, industrial engineering. It's a very long name, I guess. But um, so with that, I went into manufacturing, just like what you would ex expect. Okay. Um, I did not, I turned down at uh, the commission. So I did not go into, for example, I was in the Navy ROTC and uh, went, had gone through what, three and a half years of that. And then um, what, it, what I experienced was, this was a dot-com boom, okay? And nothing against an 01, you don't make a ton of money <laughs> when you're an 01, okay? Um, and anyway, and, and so uh, with that said, went into manufacturing, um, but I did a really weird, turn. So I went from manufacturing into um, asset management, so mutual funds. Very odd. Okay. And then from there, I went into banking <laughs> and then became a banker and then a corporate banker. And then after that, went into, uh, I guess, the fintech reason. So that's where I am currently. So um, I guess that said, whatever you guys decide, it doesn't really mean it's the end of the world. Okay, and, and case in point, heck, I, I might have still been in the Navy, okay, um, if I had decided that path, somehow joined manufacturing, 
somehow my engineering friends are still going, why'd you get into finance? <laughs> so went into finance. And from there, you know, it's, a, it, it's been a very interesting road. And I, by the way, I took five years. I, I'm not that smart. So. <laughs> so Nothing wrong with that. We love that. But, and I think it's so cool that your experience wasn't just streamlined. Do you know what I mean? That you were all over the place and that that's okay. I, I think it's cool that where you are now, it seems like hopefully you're pretty happy with where you are and it gives us hope too, like for those people that are lost as well, so. <laughs> you know what, go outside, take a left, right, straight back, okay? Whatever you decide, it will take you to whatever your next opportunity is. So that's how I've always done it. Thank you. <laughs> that warms my heart because I need that assurance sometimes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mr. Nguyen? Um, as an Asian immigrant, there was no choice. It was electrical engineering back in the 80s. Uh, so I, like I said, if you look at all the Asians, not just Vietnamese, they, probably 90% of us were in electrical engineering. There was only one Vietnamese person that studied industrial engineering, by the way, Mr. Wang. That tells you, you know, it's just that. But let me tell you, all the, for all the students, this, um, what I found, find out is that four years of Virginia Tech shows that I can study, I can think on my own. And oh, by the way, I did not stick to electrical engineering like Mr. Wang. You, you get a, if you wake up for a whole month every morning and you ask yourself, why am I going to work? Then you know you're unhappy. Then you need to change jobs, all right? So I have changed careers just like Mr. Wang. Uh, I, I'm still in engineering now because I decided then dealing with money is just not for me. So I go back to engineering. So I'm back to engineering, but just not electrical engineering. I now do software development. So the, you, know, you have to ask yourself that question. I think it does not matter what degree you study, where you work, but you have, if you wake up every morning and ask yourself, why am I going to work? And you do for one day, of course, you know, we, we all have good days, bad days, but if you're asking yourself for a whole month in a row, you probably need to look for another job. Okay. Right, thank you. Yeah. That's absolutely valuable advice for sure. Just kind of reevaluate uh, your purpose, I guess. And like, can you live your life every day like this for the rest of your life? For sure. Absolutely. And I think, uh, especially now, during the pandemic, there are a lot of people who are looking for any and every job that they can get, and it may not have to do anything with their major. Like Mel uh, Melly and I graduated <laughs> right when the pandemic started, uh, well, slightly after. And, you know, a lot of us, a lot of people in our graduating class, they were looking for anything and everything. And so I think something that tech taught a lot of us was to be flexible, to be able to pivot and to take whatever skills that you have learned, regardless of your major. I think that's something important for anyone that's watching. There are a lot of other skills and lessons that you've learned beyond you know, your major. So it's important to take note of that and use it to your advantage when you, you know, put it on your resume. Like it's, all of it is important, um, but that was really good advice. Um, and what about you, Jen? So for me, I came into college wanting to be a chiropractor or an athletic trainer or something in medicine. So I started out as a biology major um, and then I took chemistry and that did not go very well for me, similar to, similarly to probably what a lot of people experience. And so then um, I changed my major again to human nutrition, foods and exercise so that I wouldn't have to take um, some of the other harder science classes because I barely scraped by with chemistry. Um, but then I realized that none of the sciences were really working for me. And so I changed from human nutrition, foods and exercise to human development. Um, and by then I was getting ready to enter my third year of Virginia Tech. And I was like, I'm not really sure what I wanna do, but I went to the career center, talked to some advisors there and took some assessments. And they were like, you'd be really great in education or counseling and things like that. And so um, that's how I landed on human development. 
And from there, I discovered that I really love working with college students. And so I went to graduate school to get my master's degree in counselor education, working in student affairs. Um, and so, and I still graduated in four years. So that was great. I really reworked my schedule that way. So it is possible everyone out there, you can change your major a couple of times and still graduate in time. Um, but uh, I graduated from graduate school in 2019. So I've been working full time only for about two years now, but I work um, at the University of South Florida down here in Tampa, Florida. Um, so I work kind of as like a college programs coordinator, uh, similarly to different programs like this. Um, but then I also help run a peer coaching program that's kind of guided by data to help students thrive um, in their college experience. Uh, so just kind of connecting students to resources and different things like that. And it really is a lot of great stuff because in this pandemic, I'm sure that a lot of you students who are here right now have encountered a lot of different challenges. So um, although I've only been in this job for two years, I've learned a lot just about how to help all sorts of different situations. Um, and so I, I will definitely say I'm very happy with where I'm at right now in my job. So don't worry if you change your major a couple of times because you will end up where you need to be. Oh man, that's more reassurance that we all need. <laughs> and that's awesome because I know a lot of these, uh, the people who hopefully will be viewing this are undergrad students and I'm sure they're going through the same things as you guys probably did when you guys were their ages. So it means a lot. Um, actually, this is a great segue actually, because um, Jen, I was actually going to ask um, for anyone who attended grad school, actually, what, um, what advice do you have for students who are looking at grad school? Um, could you just share, I think you basically shared your experience, but if you had any advice or tips for them, that, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, my application process to get into graduate school was pretty difficult. So I put out a bunch of applications and was rejected a lot on the front end. So um, I didn't actually know that I had been accepted to my graduate school until probably like late February and then by then I had to go through interview processes to get a graduate assistantship and I didn't initially get an assistantship on the front end either. And so I, by the time that we got to like late March, I had no idea what I was going to do uh, once I graduated. Um, but then I finally got a call to say that I got an, assist an assistantship and got into graduate school. And that is all to say that it is okay to get rejected sometimes because again, you will end up where you need to. Um, and it's also important to plan a bunch of parallel plans at the same time so that you're prepared for anything. So rejection's okay, but plan a little something on the side too so that you're still taken care of. That's important. Um, but I think graduate school was just a really cool experience to dip your toe in the water of figuring out what adulthood is like because you're still, still a student, but being a graduate student is a little bit different than being an undergraduate student. And so, um, start making those adult professional connections while you're in graduate school because you never know what kinds of opportunities it'll lead you to um, to be able to get a job. Um, and don't be afraid to use the resources when you're a graduate student as well because resources at colleges are also for graduate students. I think a lot of people forget that too. So ask for help. That is always okay. Um, and just be prepared for anything when you when you get there. I love that. Having plan B, C, D, E, F, <laughs> yeah. just in case, like anything, like thinking, I guess, long term as well, because I think obviously rejection and I think failure is one of the best ways to grow. You having like all those other plan B, like just shows like how you really were. And that's awesome that you took advantage of all that. And, um, and I really like how you said graduate students are still students at these universities. People usually forget just because, you know, they might not live on campus and things like that, but they definitely have every right in the world to take advantage of all the resources that colleges give them. Okay, that's awesome. Does anyone, any other answers if you attended graduate school? Uh, Huang Wen here. Oh yeah, go ahead. I, I did uh, get a master's degree in electrical engineering. I do have um, one recommendation is like maybe work for a year or two so you know exactly what you want to study because it's a major commitment. Uh, for me, I went to work full time and I study at night. It took me three years to get my master's degree. 
and you know you throw away your social life all that beer drinking that i learned at four years of tech went away but um so you definitely want to make sure you're studying what in, in a field that that you plan to work for in the future that and then make sure your company agrees to pay for a portion of that because it gets to be very expensive yes Absolutely. Oh, like the real logistical advice now, yeah. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, thank you, That's awesome. Um, this is Dennis. I, I went to graduate school also. Um, I did exactly the same thing. You work during the day and you have a family and you go to school at night. Okay. Um, I think from my perspective, um, it use that time my mind to to network that's just my opinion okay um, the reason is that's where a lot of the, the um, entrepreneurial spirit comes away um, the in-depth understanding and um, I, I know several I'll call it cohorts in in my school have gone on to develop things that you see in, in regular life. So for example, Duolingo, that came out of a graduate study. Um, the, the Google shopping piece, for example, when the Google search engine and computer shopping, that came from alumni um, from, from our uh, graduate program. So um, it, you never know. And, and that's where I would say, um, take that leap and go to graduate school. Because that's at the time that allows you to explore in depth rather than try to worry about a grade, you know, in chemistry or biology or statistics in my case was really sucky. So, yeah. Absolutely. Seems like you're going like if you're going to grad school, you're going in like full full send, like all the way into like the, the certain subject or being almost like a subject matter expert in whatever you chose to go into grad mm -hmm. school. So if you don't like what you're going into, then what are you doing? So definitely find that interest for sure. Love that. Cool. Jackie, do you want to ask the next question? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, you're all in your respective career fields. Um, and some, you know, something that we wanted to know was, have you been able to mentor other Asian American Pacific Islander professionals? Like, have there been any other community members within, you know, within your department or just within your workplace? Um, and if so, how have you been able to mentor them? And um, anyone can go. Um, so you can just, you know, say your name and then your answer, um, if you want to answer it. This is Huang Wei. Um, you know, I've been working for what, 32 years now. So at, in my position, I think it should be expected of folks at my level to train new employees or younger, newer employees, because if you don't train them, they're never gonna learn. You know what I mean? You, you can't expect people to walk in and know everything. So you, you have to train. Now, here's the thing is I was lucky there were people ahead of me that taught me uh, how to become a leader, how to become a supervisor, how to deal with poor performers, which is really hard. But you just don't graduate from Eugene Tech and know all these things. You learn from experience, you learn from working. And I, like I said, I was lucky. So now the onus is on me to take care of the next group of people. So that way they learn that. So ment mentoring is a big deal to me. Uh, so it's a part of the, of the job. Uh, the Asians, well, we have Asian employees, then of course I mentor Asians, so, but I don't oh, okay. call it Asian specific. It is all employees, right? I, I would agree. I, um, I currently mentor, okay? And um, what I've, I've, I've several, I've mentored several, um, but I, I would say, and maybe hopefully not stereotypical, okay? But what I've encountered is we are very, most Asians in general, are very quiet. We're very reserved, okay? Um, what I usually hopefully help them understand is, um, and this is something I, I've learned along the way, you matter, you should be here, you're here and you're, um, opinion, voice, 
uh, you know, whatever your view is, is definitely worth it. Okay. And, and this is where organizations, we're not necessarily waiting, if that makes sense. In, in my industry, which is finance and fin, uh, financial technology, um, we, we try to help people understand that they need to push. Because if you cannot push, then we're never going to advance the ball and or go against the competition. So from an Asian standpoint, what I've noticed is it's just very, people are very quiet, okay? Very reserved, you know, very, very smart. But, and it's, it's like a combination of Americanism because you're, you're here in America, okay? And everyone's loud, <laughs> TikTok, YouTube, whatever, okay? But the point is you've got to be able to balance that. And, and um, that's, in my opinion, it's just push. If you can't talk, if you can't, if you cannot communicate, then find out how to communicate and then just voice your opinion because somebody's listening out there and they agree with you. <laughs> oh, I love that. Just because it's giving people that self-confidence that, you know, like what you say actually does matter and everything that like you have an opinion and we, I want to hear it. I don't want you to stay quiet. And if you never say it, then I'll never know. Do you know what I mean? things like that i love that uh Jen, they, won't you you? Oh, they won't agree with you oh they won't agree with you i'm, I'm I'll, I'll tell you this it's like talking with your sister or your brothers or your you know parents they're never going to agree with you but that doesn't mean <laughs> that you're wrong by the way that's true you're not wrong <laughs> jen did you want to say anything or yeah, so um, still being relatively early on in my career, I haven't really had an opportunity to mentor other professionals. And I think also just uh, for context to working um, on the staff side in higher education, there's not really a lot of Asian folks who work um, at colleges on the staff side of things too. And so I think um, that puts me in an interesting position and um, I've actually been able to have a lot of really good conversations with Asian, Asian students um, who recognize kind of similar experiences that I had in my undergraduate experience and they see an Asian staff member um, and they say, wow, like you're the only Asian person that I've seen who's not a professor or who um, is not working as a TA in my, in my classes and different things like that. And so um, being able to connect with students on that level uh, has been has been really I love that. Oh, that makes my heart happy. <laughs> and like I said, it's kind of, it's almost funny because you did that undergrad, like, you know, being the one Asian person in this whole, like, oh, um, like, Hoke ambassadors or, you know, like being on homecoming court or something like that, you know what I mean? And like, now you're doing it again, but it's awesome that we have great representation just like you. So, yeah. Um, oh, my next question I think is more of a general um, question for especially the students that will be viewing this. What advice do you have for students looking for interns or jobs? Back to, for some of you, 30 years. But, but if you guys could kind of go back, like what, what advice would you give to these students? Uh, I remember 30 some years ago, I applied and I, I'm, I can guarantee you it was over 90% rejection rate, but you can't give up. <laughs> I think that's true today. Today it's even easier with the uh, internet. You can find companies, look up where to apply. And, you know, you have a computer that you can type up your resume and you probably need to make five or six resumes and you select the right one and you submit to that company. Um, so for me, it has to be, um, you got to keep trying. You can't, oh, by the way, you have to be flexible. You can't just say, you know what? I only want to work for, you know, was it Facebook, Apple, whatever those big companies are. No, you got, you got to be flexible and apply to all and see which ones might. And then you can be, you know, selective and say, you know, I'll, oh, no, 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 thank you for uh, selecting me. I don't want to work for you. But until then, you just got to apply. Um, for my agency specifically, timing is very important. You need a top secret clearance just to walk into the building. Well, it takes almost a whole year to get that clearance. So guess what? You got to apply the minute school is open in September because it's going to take me from October all the way to May just to get you that clearance. So we have to hire intern the minute school is open. 
but you have to apply really early on my agency, right? So those two things you have to know, you know, for my for all those government agencies that in Northern Virginia, the government is dominant. Timing is everything, all right? I'll, I'll, I'll echo that in, in the sense that from where we're standing from and where we, we the industry that we um, function in, um, from a financial and the banks, as well as the credit union standpoint, um, internships right now are, I won't say plentiful, but they are in demand, okay? And you will get rejected. So um, I, I love what, um, what you had mentioned um, about, I just want to work for Facebook. I just want to work for Instagram. I want to work for TikTok. I want to do this. The, the issue is they're not that big, if you think about it. And so you've got thousands and thousands of people that are trying to get into the door. And, and so it's a numbers game at that point. Um, but the flip side of it is, and, and I go back to you matter because um, just because you land at an internship at a manufacturing firm, okay? Or an actuarial firm, whatever or even just working at McDonald's or Wendy's corporate office, for example. I did that, that was fun, okay? Um, guess what? What you get out of it is what you put into it, okay? What, um, what I tell a lot of people is, and there, I have one uh, person that uh, is interested in an internship and he's like going, but I got rejected from LinkedIn, Microsoft, and I go, so, <laughs> and, and that's, that's I, I think that the piece that um, we, we have to make sure we talk through is you need to be able to be resilient, but at the same time, don't take no, because you know what, there's, there's on the stock market, okay, I'll use this as an example, on the stock market, there's 22,000 uh, corporations, okay, there's 22,000, okay, that's not a lot. There are 9.5 million small businesses, medium-sized and small businesses out there. So that doesn't mean that it's the end of the world if you can't get into LinkedIn, Instagram. Um, what's Elon Musk's one? Tesla. Tesla. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter because they've got close to 10 million other corporations, small businesses, medium-sized people that just need assistance and help. So. That is what builds your resume and builds your character and builds you up so that you can actually go for that top secret clearance. And I agree with that. That's a pain in the butt to get. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Jen, do you have any other advice? Yeah, I think in addition to what they both said, I think also don't be afraid to show your personality throughout uh, the application process. So I think Obviously, you are a student at Virginia Tech, so you have a lot of great knowledge and skills, and I'm sure you'll have a lot of really great experiences. But um, what I've seen on the hiring side of a lot of different jobs is that people want to find people that they want to work with, and there are going to be a lot of people out there who have similar skills um, and experiences as you. But, um, but for example, I just helped a family friend get a job and she said that she spent a long time in her interview talking about how she plays board, ga board games on the weekends and is training her new puppy. And um, that helped set her apart in the applicant pool. And so I think uh, obviously find a balance between sharing those good experiences that are related to the job, but also don't be afraid to talk to them about what, what wakes you up in the morning and what is your motivation and what are you interested in? Because that makes you a human being. Um, because I think a lot of times people get lost in the job titles and the different bullet points that are on your resume or in the job description, but people wanna work with people as well. So uh, don't forget to show yourself there. And also don't forget to use your resources. So I think I saw um, in the chat come through that, um, that there are some great resources at the Korean Professional Development Office. So definitely utilize those resources. I also worked there for a little bit in undergrad and there's some really solid people um, who work there who are so willing to help you and not enough people um, use their services. So definitely go check that out because that's, that's a free service to you and you already pay for it. So you might as well use it. 
I love that. Oh, my heart. <laughs> Thank you guys for all the great advice. Honestly, I think it's good to hear. Like I said, I think this whole panel, it's just like, you guys are very reassuring and, you know, having that self-confidence, like, like, don't doubt yourself, you know, things like that. Um, Jackie, did you want to actually add anything or? Yeah, sure. Um, I know I'm newer to being a working professional. I've only been working less than a year. So, um, but I think for me being in uh, politics and uh, politics and public service, one of my biggest things that I needed to work on was networking. I had to stop being afraid of cold emailing people because you have no idea who's going to help you. And the tech alumni network is not only expansive, er, mostly I can't speak for every single person, but everyone that I've met has been super kind and helpful. So, you know, cast a wide net and, you know, don't be afraid to reach out to people because you may never know. Um, you know, shameless plug-in, Hokey Mentorship Connect is a great way to find alums. Um, <laughs> that's how I found Dennis and Jen, because there are people who want to help you. Um, and I think that it's important. We're afraid of rejection. We're afraid of people saying no to us, but you have to try. The worst they can say is no, you can move on from there. Um, and I think um, with with just like applying to jobs, apply for anything and everything. If there's even, you know, I mean, don't apply to jobs that you hate, but if there's something that piques your interest, even the slightest, you should do it. Cause that's how I found my current job. Um, and now I'm doing something that I love, which is public service. That's what I wanted to do this whole time. Um, but, you know, try anything and everything and, you know, push yourself, you know, go outside of your comfort zone. Cause that's where you learn the most. Um, but that's, that's the advice that I have. <laughs> I love that. Oh my goodness. That makes my heart happy because it's just, you have to put yourself out there. If you never put yourself out there, no one will ever know. And so like everyone just, everyone had great advice. Uh, props to everyone for saying that, what you said, but um, I have one last question. So up our panel and on a more question, but anyone can go. But I was just wondering, what is or was your favorite part about Virginia Tech? Yeah, I'll go first. Uh, Virginia Tech was a lot smaller. All those buildings are now new. You know, I, I go, I take my children, Monica, down there. I'm like, oh my goodness, these are all these buildings are new. The engineering building is named for the professor that used to teach me back in the eighties. You know what I mean? Hey! Yeah, no, so, like, so I feel old, you know, but um, what I like about Virginia Tech is it's because it's out in the middle of nowhere, students, I met so many students in four years of college. I mean, if you go to George Mason here, which I live in North Virginia, students drive there and they drive home. So you don't get that, um, uh, you don't build that uh, friendship and that networking helps in the future if you're ever looking for a job, for example. Or if you ever travel and say, oh yeah, so-and-so's in California, well, I'll swing by and visit them when I'm over there. So I mean, these are relationships that you can build. I, I really like that little that aspect of Virginia Tech. Being out in the middle of nowhere, the students, all you have is, is each other. So that was great for me. Absolutely. The Hokie community is something else. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I'll go. Um, I think to echo what Jennifer and, and Huang had mentioned is the the I the one thing I do take away from VT is the the community. Okay, um, as a, as a cadet, as an engineer, and also as a um, you know grad. From that perspective, I would say that uh, the the network that you build is so important. Um, because you never know who you're going to meet, say five, 10 years from now, you, you know, the, your CEO, or you may be a CEO. Okay. Um, you will always meet some VT folks, which is excellent. And they will always ask, what is a hokey? And you can always say it's a castrated turkey, right? Just kidding. <laughs> but anyway. That you, you never know who you're going to meet. And it's, it's amazing the network that you will uh, advance and, and be able to be exposed to. Sorry. 
Yeah. And just to add to that, um, I think for me too, it really is that sense of you always have um, common ground with someone once you find out that they also went to Virginia Tech or even people who were just associated with Virginia Tech, like, oh, I have a sister that went there or a cousin or whatever that might be. Um, and I think it beyond that, it's also just the joy that you see in people's faces when they talk about their experiences with Virginia Tech um, and even just the, the connections that you can make beyond that. And so, um, so for me, like I'm meeting all these people here for the first time today, and you can tell that everyone is so passionate about the work that they do and passionate about their experiences and just passionate about helping others. And I think that that is something that uh, it is a pretty common string that you meet with most Virginia Tech people. And so that will always be the part that, that I always go back to. I just wanna echo what Jen said. Um, I have a neighbor who I met when I moved back from Blacksburg to here and they found out that I went to Virginia Tech. They were asking all these questions like, oh, do you miss Blacksburg? How is it? Like, what has changed? And we live near um, like a walking trail that cuts through the neighborhood. Um, and if we're wearing hokey gear and someone else, they'll see it and like, they'll be like, oh, like you went to tech or something like that. And my mom would always tell me when I was in Blacksburg, we'd be talking on the phone and she'd be like, yeah, like another one of our neighbors like stopped us because they saw that we were wearing like a Virginia tech hat. And then we just kept talking and talking. And, um, I think, I think it's really cute how you can bond over something like that, but you, it's, um, it shows what tech can do to you, how much it affects one, like how it affects someone because they have such positive experiences. They've gained a lot of connections and made a lot of memories at tech um, that even years from now, if they even see, you know, the VT logo or the little hokey tracks, like it reminds them of something special. So I, I can definitely agree with the community aspect. I, I want to just add on to that because it's funny, um, my family, we went on vacation probably a year or two ago and I was wearing my Virginia Tech stuff because I was still an undergrad and I was on vacation. I think we were in the middle of Mexico or something like, and we were at a resort and another man was wearing Virginia Tech gear. I think he was wearing a cap and I was like, let's go. And he was like, hokies. Like he just knew like what to say as soon as I said, let's go. So like having that, I guess like, everyone knows that chant, like, do you know what I mean? Or H-O-K-I-E-S Hokies, like having that, and it's it's in the back of your mind and, and it's almost like automatic, like you don't even think about it. When like someone says that, it just, it's like a natural instinct to like say Hokies right after. I think it's just so cool that we have a community like that. And just everyone that I've met at Virginia Tech has definitely have, has made me the person I am today. And I wouldn't want it anyone any other way. So thank you guys for sharing appreciate it. Thank you all so much. Excuse my lighting. Um, the sun has set, but I don't have a lamp near me. So we're using my laptop glow. Um, <laughs> I just want to say thank you to everyone. This does conclude our career power hour panel. This is also a very exciting milestone for APITAS because it's our first ever event that we hosted and executed. Um, so we're very excited about that. And um, just want to quickly direct everyone that's here to check out the chat because Weston, Latanya, and Dr. Ha have put in some great resources. So the ACE Center webpage, Hokey Mentorship Connect, um, Latanya put the APITA's Facebook page as well as um, local alumni chapters in your area. We There's one in the DC region, Richmond, everywhere because Hokies were everywhere. Um, so check out those links that are in the chat because they're very resourceful. And, um, and our panelists are totally cool to, uh, with connecting with any students that have any specific questions. This is a great time to network, like I said, cold email people. So we'll be sharing that information in the best way to contact them um, and we'll get that distributed soon. Um, but thank you all so much um, for being here, being a part of this community and um, for being at our first event. Uh, make sure you know, to follow you know, the ACE Center, Career and Professional Development, Alumni Relations, Ascend, um, I'm missing one, SACE. 
And um, of course, APITAS, the Asian Pacific Islander Desi Alumni Society, we're on Instagram and Facebook as Latanya shared for any future updates. But yeah, thank you all so much for coming. And thank you, a huge thank you to our panelists for taking the time to talk with us because I have definitely learned a lot and I've gained a lot of um, advice. So thank you all. Yep. Don't be surprised if I send a LinkedIn request. <laughs> <laughs> thank you everyone yeah thank you Thanks. thank you everybody awesome i am going to stop the video now <laughs> All right.